Good morning and welcome to the 2022 Bampton Lectures. The Bampton Lectures have been happening in this church since 1780 and they are traditionally elected by the heads of house. In reality these days, not all heads of house are interested in theology and so a small group of Bampton trustees elects a lecturer and I'm delighted that the, my fellow trustees, I'm the chair of the Bampton Lectures, my fellow trustees, Miles Young of New College, Nick Austin of Campion Hall and Carol Souter of St Cross College uh, are here today. My name's Jane Shaw, by the way. Um, it's a huge pleasure to welcome as the 2022 Bampton Lecturer an historian whose work I have long admired, not only for its brilliance and originality and depth, but also for its sensitivity and emotional intelligence. Alec Rari is Professor of the History of Christianity at Durham University. His primary research area is the Protestant Reformation, but he writes about Protestantism more widely, and in fact his most recent book was on the question of unbelief. His, it was the fruit of a Leverhulme Major Research Fellowship and is titled Unbelievers, An Emotional History of Doubt, and that was published in 2019. His current research is on the history of how Protestantism became a global religion in the 17th century, a largely untold story. Professor Rari read history at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, Reformation Studies at St Andrews, and then uh, did a DPhil here at Oxford under the supervision of Professor Dermot McCulloch. He taught in the history department at the University of Birmingham before moving to Durham in 2007, where he served as head of department for three years from 2012 to 2015. In addition to his role in Durham, he's also a professor of divinity at Gresham College London, a role that's just finished which means he's dedicated to presenting the history of Christianity, the history of religion, to a truly wide public. That's part of the purpose of the Gresham Lectures. And he does so also on television and radio and in print online and online. He's one of the co-editors of the Journal of Ecclesiastical History and in 2019 to 2021 was president of the Ecclesiastical History Society. He's also a licensed reader in the Church of England. He's held research fellowships at the Folger Shakespeare Library three times, the Huntington Library in California, and the Leibniz Institute for European History. In 2019, he was deservedly elected a fellow of the British Academy. I'd also like to add that he has been elected the Ford Lecturer in the History Department here at Oxford in 2024, but I'm deeply happy that we, the Bampton Trustees, elected him first. The way this works is that he will give two of his four lectures this morning, one at 10 and one at 11.30. At the end of his 10 o'clock lecture, there may be time for two or three questions here in the audience. I'm sorry for those who are watching the live stream that you won't be part of that. And then we will have a coffee break we will start sharply again at 11.30. So without further ado, let me welcome Professor Alec Rari to the podium. Jane, thank you very much for that kind welcome and to the trustees for electing me to this, this lectureship, which is a, a considerable honor. Um, especially so since, as Jane said, I've uh, made my path as a Reformation historian, as an early modernist, and that's not the story that I'm going to be telling you today. Um, I'm a, a long way outside my, my, my academic home, um, though if anybody has come to a lecture with these titles expecting something on the Reformation, then I think you've no one to blame but yourselves. The age of Hitler is not, I'm going to suggest, the 1930s and 1940s. It is our own lifetimes. It began in the 1940s, but wasn't really in full swing until the 1960s, and is now, I think, coming to an end. 
My purpose in these four lectures is to explain why I think it's helpful to see our own times in this way and what it tells us about what may come next. The reason I call this era the period that even 80 years on we still instinctively call the post-war era, the reason I call this the age of Hitler is because he is its most unifying figure. He is our touchstone, our backstop. In a world where we seem increasingly unable to agree on anything, we can all agree on condemning him, or rather the few people who will come to his defense, thereby reveal themselves to be monsters. Even in the war, which has erupted in Europe since February, he provides the framing. Not only that Mr. Putin is one of a whole series of post-war villains to be cast in that part, but that he and his regime's propaganda relentlessly justify Russia's war by labeling Ukrainians as Nazis. An accusation which is, is perverse, but I think significant. And that's only the latest of many, many examples. As I hope to persuade you, we define our values principally and ultimately with reference to Nazism, and we can't shake our fascination with them and with their leader. I first remember hearing his name when I was around six years old, sometime in the late 1970s. I remember asking my mother uh, something like, who is the worst person ever? And I'm sure she gave a measured and sensible answer, but she did mention one name. Who else could you have chosen? Who else would you choose? It's stuck in my mind like a burr. Evil is fascinating, and absolutes are as well. My next flash of memory, I mean, it might have been the same afternoon, it might have been weeks later, is of asking her, so has anyone ever written a book about Hitler? And I remember at the time feeling that my question was slightly shameful. My instinct would be that it would be wrong to write a book about a bad man, that it was probably even wrong to ask the question. But I was hungry to know about this, this reference point for wickedness. And to my considerable surprise, my mother replied, oh yes, there's lots of books about it. And she showed me one. High on a shelf was this fat hardback volume with that name on it in big barefaced capitals, Alan Bullock's 1952 biography. Now, my childish instinct may have been morally sound, but it was, of course, spectacularly wrong. There are a lot of books about Hitler, more of them every year, not just because he was an enormously consequential historical figure, but because I'm not the only person to have found evil fascinating. He doesn't belong to the serious historians. They have to share him with the storytellers and the myth-makers and anyone who wants to stiffen whatever they're drinking with a shot of cheap moral spirits. We can't stop retelling and reinventing his story and the endlessly faceted story of the war against him. Even now, a lifetime later, the films, the books, the ever more tenuous documentaries keep coming. And there he is in the title of these lectures too, but I'm afraid that's a trick. These lectures are not really going to be about him. They're about us. They're not really even, I'm afraid, going to be history lectures in which I might amass new and unfamiliar evidence to tell you a story you don't know. Instead, I'm going to do something a little more preacherly to tell you a story that I hope you will realize you already do know. A story about our times that will seem familiar. My aim is to put a frame around something that I think we know, to hold up a mirror to our own times at a particular angle and hope we recognize what we see. Two reasons for doing this. One is the historian's reason to help us understand how we've got to where we are. And the second one is the more practical one. The age of Hitler is, I hope to show you, coming to an end. I think on balance that this is a good thing, that our appalled fascination with the Nazis probably doesn't have a lot more to teach us 
But whether or not you approve of the Hitler-centric moral universe that we've grown up in, it was at least reasonably stable and based on a very broad consensus. But in the 2020s and beyond, stability and consensus look likely to be in short supply. What is going to follow this age? In the second pair of lectures next week, I'll make some suggestions about where our shared and fracturing values are going, about where I think they should go, and about how we might possibly get there. But today my subject is more historical. Before I come to that, I have a few ground rules to clarify. I keep talking about us, but who do I mean? Well, the simple answer is Western Europe and North America, especially Britain and the United States, not just because those are the two countries I know best, but because their similar but different paths through the age of Hitler have been very influential beyond their borders. But that simple answer won't really do because part of the point is that the values that I'm talking about are, or they claim to be, universal. The wartime allies formally called themselves, during the war, the United Nations. And they bequeathed that name to the new organization that they created in 1945. The whole institutional architecture of the post-war world, above all the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was conceived in the shadow of the Second World War in an attempt to apply its lessons to the whole planet. Of course, it hasn't quite worked out that way. I think it's of some significance that Russia remembers that war as the Great Patriotic War, a particular, not a universal, struggle. And as Rana Mitter has reminded us, China's vivid memory of the war is different again. Even so, the values of the age of Hitler have certainly been instrumental in shaping events all around the world, especially, but not only, by informing how the Western powers have responded to them. This has been the age in which the Western powers that won the Second World War have set the terms of global conversation. That's, of course, one of the things that's coming to an end. To see how this has worked, consider what happens when someone somewhere in the world refuses or fails to conform to our shared anti-Nazi values. Occasionally this is done symbolically and defiantly. In the late 1990s, the Zimbabwean government's brutal enforcer and self-described terrorist, Chenjerai Hitler Hunzvi, gloried in his nickname as a means of signalling his ruthlessness and instilling fear. And maybe it worked, but it also badly dented that government's already shaky credentials for its anti-colonial virtues. More commonly, people or movements discredit themselves with real or perceived echoes of Nazism. We're going to meet a number of examples of this. Maybe the most obvious is the persistent tendency of many anti-Israeli or anti-Zionist movements around the world to stray or lapse into open anti-Semitism. In the age of Hitler, doing that is crossing a red line, and it means forfeiting much of the sympathy you might otherwise have had. Even Vladimir Putin may have been surprised that his invasion of Ukraine has met with such startlingly different responses than his comparably brutal wars in Chechnya or Syria or his equally illegal annexation of Crimea because none of those events triggered our collective memories of 1938 to 40 the way that this one has. For any would-be tyrant, butcher or dictator anywhere in the world for the past 75 years, a sensible rule of thumb is try to oppress people in ways that are not directly reminiscent of the Nazis, because you are much more likely to get away with it. So, in geographical terms, my story is a set of concentric circles, with Britain and then the Anglophone world at its heart, then spreading to the rest of Europe, including the very different cases of Germany and Russia, and then finally with an eye to the rest of the planet. And if that seems Eurocentric and Atlanticist, well, I'm talking about a Eurocentric and Atlanticist era in world history. And 
defining my chronological scope is equally problematic because although I've said it's a post-war one, in some ways we need to look back some decades earlier. But I want to begin in 1947 when the American radio network ABC began broadcasting a series called, modestly, The Greatest Story Ever Told. It ran for nearly 10 years, was broadcast in over 50 countries, it spawned a novel, and eventually an epic star-studded movie. And that teasing, irresistible title was itself an allusion to a poem called Tell Me the Old, Old Story, written by an English woman in 1866 that had been set to music the following year and become a popular hymn. Now, neither the poem nor the story nor the radio series explicitly named the story in question. That's the point. You didn't need to. Everyone knew what you meant. It's, of course, the story of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Catherine Hankey wrote her poem, and for decades afterwards, that story was still the most important story in Western culture. And the figure of Jesus had a unique moral authority. The reason that I call the post-war era the age of Hitler is that this is the era when the, the story of Jesus has been replaced as the defining narrative of our culture by the story of the Second World War. How our culture's greatest story became the anti-Nazi rather than the Christian narrative, that's the subject of this first lecture. The point is not that Victorian society on either side of the Atlantic was universally Christian. And it felt at the time like an age of, of, of pell-mell secularization. Friedrich Nietzsche famously declared in 1882 that God was dead and we, whoever that means, had killed him. Alternative philosophies and worldviews were springing up like mushrooms. Darwinian evolution had apparently rendered God unnecessary and had then been warped into a eugenicist theory of a progressive life force by the likes of Herbert Spencer. Historians and archaeologists were reading what now looked like rather overblown conclusions about the unreliability of the Bible. Marxists were rejecting Christianity as oppressive conspiracy. Burgeoning industrial cities were leaving church establishments behind. Spiritualists, theosophists, any number of other movements were crowding in. But the old landscape of Christendom wasn't eroding equally quickly on all sides and some of the damage looked worse than it was. Scientists and historians might be eating away at Christianity's intellectual credibility, but intellectual critiques have never mattered as much as intellectuals like to think. Plenty of Christians found those critiques easy to answer or to ignore. Likewise, if the social dislocation of industrialization and urbanization undermined the old legacy churches, the currents were also sweeping in new movements like the Salvation Army or the Pentecostals after the turn of the century. And crucially, one vital Christian stronghold was rock solid. Even the fiercest critics of Christianity, with maybe the striking and significant exception of Nietzsche, were united by one thing, which is they accepted the moral authority of Jesus Christ. He, and through him Christianity, still unequivocally towered over the age's ethics in the manner of the, the huge stature of him that was placed defiantly over the city of Rio in the 1920s. Now, it might seem banal to point out that Christians were keen on Jesus, but Victorian and early 20th century Christians were keen on him in a new way. And this is an enthusiasm which they shared with most of their ages atheists and agnostics. Christian orthodoxy, of course, describes Jesus Christ as both God and human. And for most of Christian history, his divine nature has been to the fore. But 19th century Christianity turned anew to his humanity. Sometimes this was a cover for attempts to rewrite or demystify Christian doctrine, but often not. In 1865, an anonymous book appeared, published in London, titled Ecce Homo. This is a, the phrase is a well-known quotation from John's Gospel, in which Pontius Pilate presents Jesus to his accusers, saying, behold the man. This isn't the first attempt to 
rewrite Jesus's story as a human life. But notorious earlier ventures by skeptics like David Friedrich Strauss and Ernst Renan had been overt attacks on Christianity and so condemned themselves to niche readerships. But the author of this book, the classical scholar John Seeley, he published it anonymously because he didn't want to alarm his devout family. Seeley's trying something subtler. He's not attacking or defending doctrines about who Jesus was, instead giving a compelling account of him as a man and as a moral teacher. And this really hits the sweet spot of controversy. It makes his book talked about but not reviled. He runs through six editions in the first year. His fans include plenty of resolutely orthodox Christians, not least the about-to-be Prime Minister William Gladstone. By the time Seeley's name does leak out, it's clear his book is nothing to be ashamed of. He's appointed Regis Professor of Modern History at Cambridge, and the royalties from this book serve him and his publisher well for the rest of his life. More to the point, he starts a trend. First a trickle and then a flood of humanized lives of Jesus appear. Most of them with the work of straightforwardly orthodox Christians. Frederick Farrar's The Life of Christ in 1874 so burnished its author's pious credentials that he ends up as Dean of Canterbury. By 1906, shortly after Farrow's death, an astonishing 5,000 retellings of the life of Jesus had been published in Britain alone. <laughs> the old, old story, indeed. Like the story of the Second World War in our own age, this is a narrative that the Victorian era does not grow tired of hearing. And it's not just Christians. Skeptics, free thinkers, agnostics, atheists, but a small, though combative, sliver of 19th century society have this much in common with their Christian antagonists. They are Jesus enthusiasts. And this goes back a long way. Baruch Spinoza, the 17th century Jewish free thinker who lays the philosophical foundations for modern atheism, despite not really himself being an atheist, Spinoza calls Jesus not so much the prophet as the mouthpiece of God and insists that his ethical teaching is so superior to anyone else's that the voice of Christ may be called the voice of God. And it comes to be thoroughly conventional for radical critics of the churches to make the same point. They might ridicule the notion of a God, but they don't want anyone to think they're criticizing Jesus. Tom Paine, the author of the, the first really popularly successful anti-Christian book, The Age of Reason, Tom Paine goes out of his way to exclude Jesus from his ample list of targets on the grounds that the morality he preached and practiced was of the most benevolent kind and has not been exceeded by any. No stouter an atheist than John Stuart Mill insisted that the authentic sayings of Jesus of Nazareth weren't merely in harmony with the intellect and feelings of every good man and woman, but that they almost constituted true humanity. He says, that they should be forgotten or cease to be operative on the human conscience while human beings remain cultivated and civilized may be pronounced once for all impossible. Now, we might doubt whether this genuflection at Jesus' morals was always sincere. But if it wasn't, then these writers, who generally were not afraid of stirring up trouble, recognized that there was a line they would be wise not to cross. They might despise the riddling Jewish peasant in their hearts, but only a world-class narcissist like Napoleon or a wild provocateur like Nietzsche would dare actually speak out against him. When Bertrand Russell gave his, set out his stall in his 1927 lecture, Why I Am Not a Christian. He gave the notion of God both barrels. But he changed his tone when it came to the question of whether Christ was the best and wisest of men. He correctly observed that it is generally taken for granted that we shall all agree that that was so, including, he says, by his fellow skeptics. And in uncharacteristically tentative mode, Russell dares to suggest that I do not believe that one can grant either the superlative wisdom or the superlative goodness of Christ. 
But this is preceded by an extended passage slathering some of Jesus' ethical principles with fulsome praise. I mean, a century on, this looks almost comically cautious, but it is as far as he dares go. Any more, and he's going to look like a monster. There is, of course, a further reason for Christianity's opponents to praise Jesus, which is that he is the ideal witness against Christianity. Jesus' humility, generosity, the bold simplicity of his ethics, or his radical egalitarianism, these things almost beg to be contrasted with Christian churches and doctrines which display none of those virtues. This is the mood in which Thomas Jefferson claimed to follow the principles of the philosophy of Jesus, rather than a Christianity which he denied its supposed founder would recognize. The 19th century's most famous fictional unbeliever, um, Dostoevsky's Ivan Karamazov, built his case against the church through his mesmerizing parable of the Grand Inquisitor, the embodiment of the church who puts Jesus on trial, castigating him for his total failure of moral realism, and the wordless Jesus responds only with a kiss. Even Bertrand Russell took the chance to insist that there are a good many points upon which I agree with Christ a great deal more than the professing Christians do. And he dryly observed that although Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin was a most sincere Christian, I should not advise any of you to go and smite him on one cheek. Now, this sort of thing is more than just knockabout fun. It's a sign that the rock that Christianity's moral authority was built on was less solid than it appeared. It's hardly news that there was a visible gap between the teaching of Jesus and the actual behavior of Christians. And for centuries, that perception had been a strength. It had spurred movements for reform and moral renewal. Maybe Europe's and America's churches could have pulled off the same trick in the 20th century. Maybe their moral fissures were already severe enough that they were bound to crumble. We don't know. What we do know is that the crisis that broke them was the defining moral event of the age, the Second World War. Back in the First World War, the enthusiasm which Christians on all sides had sanctified their respective national causes had played quite well at the time, but it began to look ill-judged during the 20s and 30s as public memory of that war soured. But there was now in the, what we call the interwar era, a new enemy, the aggressively, murderously atheistic force of communism, which had seized Russia in 1917 and was spreading its poison across the globe. It seemed self-evident to most European and American Christians in the 20s and 30s that godless communism was the defining threat that their civilization faced. When new regimes began to bubble up in parts of interwar Europe, the main question for Christians was whether or not they were anti-communist. So Mussolini's antics might be ridiculous or regrettable, but whatever else he is, he's not a threat to Christendom. Whereas the radicals of Republican Spain, they're genuinely frightening. The Spanish church was quick to see General Franco's war against them as a struggle for its own survival. And as for Germany, the thuggishness of the Nazis was distasteful, but you know, omelets and eggs. Here's a political party committed in its founding documents to what it called positive Christianity in a country where the centrist democratic parties looked like a spent force, where a communist election victory was all too plausible and plenty of Christians could at least nod along with Germany's Jews being returned to second-class status. Now, after all, they were obstinate Christ killers, and the ones who'd broken free of their stiff-necked superstitions were mostly communists. I can feel myself sort of slipping into ironic mode as I, as I tell that story. But we shouldn't be too self-satisfied about our moral superiority. I mean, to us, now, it, 
seems a self-evident truth that fascism in general and Nazism in particular were an acute, a unique and an intolerable evil that they should have been confronted as soon as they reared their heads. But the plain truth is that most people at the time were slow to recognize this. That as late as 1938, many sober European Christians saw communism still as the more fundamental threat. It is not an accident, it is not a trivial oversight that so many Christians collaborated with or nodded along to or downplayed the threat of Nazism. It was an authentic reflection of their worldviews. That only changes when the insatiability of Nazi expansionism becomes inescapable from 1937 onwards, above all when the Nazi Soviet Pact of 1939 makes it absolutely clear who is on whose side. By the time war was declared in Europe in September 1939, then there was a frame, an ideological frame for it. That frame is articulated maybe most famously at the Life and Work conference held here in Oxford in 1937, one of the foundation moments of the modern ecumenical movement. A conference that makes a real effort to transcend not just denomination but also national boundaries to advance a vision of what it calls a world Christian community which would transcend the limits of nationality and race and recover in our modern world the unity which was the ideal of the Middle Ages. Felt like a new idea. Not really though. The war that we now call the First World War was at the time and in many year the years afterwards commonly called the Great War. A phrase which as we now tend to forget was a shorthand for as the medals issued afterwards said, the Great War for Civilization. Great referred less to the war's scale than to the momentous matter that was seen to be at stake. The Western Allies in 1914 to 18, especially Britain and that enthusiastic latecomer to the war, the United States, assertively claimed they're fighting not just for civilization, but for Christian civilization. Of course, Imperial Germany made the same claims. And now, in the 1930s, it seemed that the same struggle was going to be resumed. Winston Churchill's finest hour speech in June 1940 explicitly claimed Britain's struggle as a struggle for Christian civilization. In the same year, 1940, another complicatedly transatlantic member of the British establishment, T.S. Eliot, who had been a leading participant at the Oxford Conference back in 37, published his The Idea of a Christian Society, which argued that the only alternative to Nazism and communism was a new Christian culture. Unfortunately, he then goes on to make clear just how impossible this was. Eliot's vision requires both governments and entire populations self-consciously to subscribe to what he calls a Christian framework and a positive set of values, so that those who dissent, he says, must remain marginal. I think the impossibility of his vision is just a little too sinister to be charming. But in fact, the Western Allies would end up adopting a subtly different objective. This was not a second great war for Christian civilization. This new struggle quickly came to be known as the World War. The original Great War now began to be redesignated as the first in what was a series. Not necessarily meaning a war fought all over the world. Until the end of 1941, it's very much actually a European war, seen as virtually unconnected to the ongoing butchery in China much less of a global conflict than 1914 to 18 had been at that stage. But it was a war for the world. A war fought in the name of universal principles against an aggressor that wanted to overthrow them. And those principles were, as, um, as, as President Roosevelt and Churchill put it, freedom of speech and of worship and freedom from want and fear everywhere in the world. 
Besides that, T.S. Eliot's new Christian culture looks particularist and parochial and almost mean. It's Roosevelt's America who coined a, an ingenious new label for what the Allies were defending. Not Christian civilization, but Judeo-Christian civilization. Now, under other circumstances, conscripting Judaism into a supporting role in a Christian drama might have seemed crass. But at this moment, it was an inspired move. I mean, of course, it directly defies Nazism's overwhelming obsession with Jews and Judaism. And contrary to some trends in liberal Protestant theology, firmly asserted Christianity's Jewish roots. But it also makes clear that this newly imagined Judeo-Christian civilization is irreducibly plural. A broad-based alliance, which by going so far as to embrace Judaism, also makes it unmistakably clear that both Catholics and Protestants are part of this united front. It is true that in 1942, President Roosevelt said to two of his staffers, one of them a Catholic, one of them a Jew, that you know that this is a Protestant country and the Catholics and Jews are here under sufferance. But he was joking in his sort of sawtoothed way. And they knew it. By then, America was committed to fighting for a world of religious freedom. And if America's collective religious imagination as yet only extended to Protestantism, Catholicism, and Judaism, the point still stood. Forgive me if I mention here an incident that some of you may have heard me describe before. In February 1943, the American troop ship, the Dorchester, was torpedoed off the Canadian coast. Four military chaplains, two Protestants, a Catholic and a Jew, were on board. And according to the accounts given by the survivors, the four chaplains worked together to hurry men into lifeboats and then distributed life jackets. And when the life jackets ran out, they gave their own to four young soldiers. They then joined hands, singing and praying together on the deck as the ship sank. And reportedly, they were reciting the Shema, the Jewish affirmation of God's oneness, as the waters took them. The four chaplains became symbols of an America united for Judeo-Christian civilization against its godless foes, celebrated from the postage stamp through the memorial in Michigan, through to an interfaith chapel in Philadelphia dedicated by President Truman himself. The supporting, even token, role that Jews and Judaism played in this united front, of course, turned out to be more significant than it seemed at the time. It, I mean, it was, of course, universally known in the West that Nazi Germany persecuted Jews and sent them to concentration camps. Wartime propaganda made a certain amount of this, as a prime example of Nazi barbarism. For example, in the 1944 British film, Mr. Emmanuel, the story of an English Jew who naively goes to Germany in 1938 to search for the mother of a child refugee, um, and who in the end is, is lucky to escape with his life. Significantly, Mr. Emmanuel is himself a refugee from Soviet Russia. But compelling as this film is, Compared to the reality of what was happening to European Jews in the year that it was made, what it depicts is almost comically restrained. The Gestapo are sinister and brutal, but there are not indiscriminate killings. The film's denouement is that Mr. Emmanuel finds the boy's mother, and she's alive and well, but she's married a prominent Nazi and has buried both her Jewish identity and the fact that she has a son. He returns to England to tell the boy that his mother is dead. It's not quite the film that you would have made if you had truly known what was happening in the death camps. You know, generally, wartime propaganda exaggerates the enemy's atrocities. And much of Western public opinion was sophisticated enough to discount propaganda claims on that basis. Most people were genuinely not to know that in this instance, the propaganda had fallen short of an almost incomprehensible truth. 
If some in Western intelligence circles had an idea of what they might expect to find when the death camps were liberated. The shock of the British troops who liberated Bergen-Belsen and the Americans who liberated Dachau in April 1945 was genuine. And the shock of those at home who saw the newsreels equally so. Whether or not they should have expected what they found, they didn't. One measure of that shock is the number of summary killings of members of the SS at the camps by Allied forces, killings which military discipline generally chose to overlook. For a great many of the soldiers who witnessed the camps, it was a formative moral moment. Yet most Christian, even Judeo-Christian armies, are told that they are fighting the forces of evil. They weren't to know that just this once it turned out to be true. For those who'd proclaimed a war for Judeo-Christian civilization and had done so in Roosevelt's sense of a Christian war with Jews and others permitted on sufferance, from that perspective, 1945 looked like a horrifying but a decisive victory. Admittedly, it was a little awkward that the decisive part in this war for Christian civilization had been played by the assertively atheist Soviet Union. But no one had ever pretended that this was anything other than an alliance of convenience. Churchill liked to talk of the Grand Alliance, a term which nicely conveyed both its scale and the ideological distance that it spanned. Nor was anybody surprised when the Western Allies immediately turned back to the confrontation which, with communism from which Hitler had so rudely interrupted them. During the late 40s and 50s, it looked as if the democratic and capitalist West might build its new identity around Christianity, as had happened so often before. I, this is a period of religious revival in the United States. It's the age of Billy Graham, the period when the proportion of Americans who formerly belonged to a church reached its highest ever. In 1954, the words under God were added to the American Pledge of Allegiance, in 1956, the United States' historic official motto, a pluribus unum, was replaced with in God we trust. The existential threat that the American Republic had once faced had been secession and civil war. Now it was godless communism. The Christian resurgence in Britain in the same, year, the same era is, is more modest, but it, people at the time do think it's happening, especially amongst students in the burgeoning universities who flocked to join the student Christian movement. And in liberated Europe, the democratic centre-right is boldly redefined in this period by a string of Christian Democrat parties, whose name declared that they're neither communist nor fascist, nor, Christian in a, nor, nor, nor denominationally sectarian. And in the western zones of occupied Germany in particular, the churches are put at the centre of reconstruction and denazification efforts. They are trusted implicitly, and not always with good reason, to be free of the taint of collaboration. And in the United States, the radio series The Greatest Story Ever Told is a roaring success. The film that was eventually commissioned is one of a string of Hollywood biblical epics from this period. A surge of cinematic narratives that seem to echo that Victorian literary surge of Lives of Christ. Christian civilization is ready for its battle with communism. But by the time the long-delayed film is finally released in 1965, the world has changed out from underneath it. A project that when it was started must have seemed like a license to print money only manages global box office takings of $15 million, which covers three quarters of its production costs. And it receives a critical panning, partly because it's fully four hours long. It's now best remembered for John Wayne's unintentionally comic cameo as the centurion at Calvary. Reverence is no longer the order of the day. The hapless film producers find their projects stranded on the wrong side of a cultural watershed. There have been all kinds of reasons advanced for the sudden, unexpected cultural shift that takes place across much of the Western world in the early 60s, many of them by specialist historians with a much greater claim to know what they're talking about than I have. Um, certainly, I find Callum Brown's claim that, that this truly is a sudden cultural shift in that era broadly persuasive. 
he would link it to the transformation in gender roles and gender politics that accompanied sexual liberation and above all the advent of the contraceptive pill, which is made generally available in the United States in 1960 and in West Germany and in Britain in 1961. The British decision incidentally was made by the then Minister of Health Enoch Powell. 1960 is also the year of the Lady Chatterley trial, which as Philip Larkin pointed out was soon followed by the beginning of sexual intercourse. Now, I, I don't want to dismiss the immense impact of, of these changes, uh, not least because in religious terms, their effect was powerfully to reinforce a suspicion which had long been growing about Christian ethics. I've already suggested that the one undisputed role that Christianity provided in Western societies was to provide moral norms as personified in the person, person of Jesus. But it's beginning to appear that Christianity's moral priorities were peculiar. Maybe even that its moral principles were. Readily available contraception made Christianity's traditional norms of sexual ethics seem quaint. At least it made them seem to rest far more on tradition, authority, and the desire for social control than on any moral intuition or reasoning. And of course, these are norms that had been widely violated for many centuries. But the novelty was that people who violated them now could do so and honestly and earnestly conclude that they had no reason to feel guilty. But powerful as it was, I do think this is important, it is only one part of a wider movement around the centrality of Christian ethics, a movement which ultimately looks back to the crucible of the Second World War. Not everybody in the Western world has skipped on from the horrors of 1945 to the comforting certainties of the Cold War without pausing to look around them. Many of those who did pause had to conclude that if the Second World War represented the keenest moral test that Western civilization had ever faced, Christianity had not come out of that test particularly well. It's not just the active collaboration of many churches with fascism and Nazism, as most notoriously in the, 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 the so-called German Christian movement. It's also the painful slowness of the non-collaborating churches to wake up to what was going on. The ancient complicity of the churches in anti-Semitism, which post-war churches were generally leaving behind rather than actively coming to terms with. I mean, of course, that's at the heart of it. But it's only the centerpiece of a wider display of moral failings, which the war had painfully exposed. Many Christians in Germany and elsewhere had either enth enthusiastically or resignedly accepted Nazi or fascist rule, telling themselves that whatever vulgarities or cruelties these crude new masters might perpetrate, at least the Christian family was being preserved. The Jews were being returned to their traditional second-class status. The ghastly threat of communism was being kept at bay. That collective moral judgment wasn't some ghastly misunderstanding. It was absolutely the core of the devil's bargain that far-right movements made with their societies. And if the churches were not fully aware of what they were doing when they made that bargain, it was because they chose not to be. You didn't have to be like Paul Althaus, the German Luther scholar, great scholar, who believed that the Nazi seizure of power in 1933 was the occasion for a national spiritual awakening, which he called a gift and a miracle of God. You simply needed to relax into that sense of self-centered relief. Unpleasant as it all might be, at least the trains ran on time and the communists were kept out. And if it was regrettable that the Gestapo were coming for the socialists and the trade unionists and the Jews, well, at least they weren't going to come for you. That very widespread Christian response to the far right in the 30s had been made possible by Christianity's hierarchy of values. These Christians didn't approve 
of cruelty, warmongering, street thuggery, let alone systematic murder. If they were drawn to the racial theories of the far right, that's generally despite rather than because of their religious values. But the disapproval or unease that many of them certainly felt about these things was outweighed by the value they put on maintaining social order, on defending the public status of Christianity against its mockers, profaners, blasphemers, and on reasserting long-standing Christian sexual and family morals. The judgment that the horrors of the far right was a price worth paying was, by and at the war's end, mercilessly exposed. Two well-known pivotal figures in particular realized this by 1945 itself, a Janus-faced pair of opposites who, quite unbeknownst to each other, reached interlocking conclusions from very different starting points. One of them I'll come to in the next lecture, um, and you should feel free to guess during the break who it might be. Um, but for now, we're going to turn to the German Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer had understood what he called the radical evilness of evil, which Nazism represented, more quickly than most. And that ultimately leads him to abandon Lutheranism's conventionally supine approach to politics, and ultimately it leads to his judicial murder in April of 1945, two weeks before the camp where he was held was liberated. But his now famous letters from prison, written over the previous year and a half, show him groping towards radical conclusions about where the war had left Christianity. We are, he famously wrote, proceeding towards a time of no religion at all. Men as they now are simply cannot be religious anymore. Those who honestly describe themselves as religious don't in the least act up to it. So when they say religious, they evidently mean something quite different. The idea of secularization was, of course, almost a banal one by this time. But, I mean, you would expect a Christian pastor like Bonhoeffer to, to oppose it. But instead, he has become so appalled by the parody, which it seems Western Christianity has become, that its demise is to be welcomed, maybe even embraced as God's will. Maybe, he says, Christianity is merely a preliminary stage to doing without religion altogether, or as he famously puts it, an infantile stage which a world come of age has outgrown. His hope was that he would find that religion is no more than the garment of Christianity, so that what would be needed is a religion-less Christianity. But he also knew that this wasn't an answer. As he says at the end of his fullest letter on this subject, the outward aspect of this religionless Christianity, the form it takes, is something which I'm giving much thought to, and I shall be writing to you again about it very soon. And he does indeed come back again and again in his letters to the question of what this might mean in practice. What might be left when hierarchies and forms and jargon and wealth and power have been stripped away to leave a Christ-like Christianity serving the world in weakness. His letters are full of phrases like, I am thinking over the problem at present. More about that next time, I hope. If he made any progress with it before the Nazis hanged him, his surviving letters don't record it. Maybe his death itself is a kind of answer, but it's not really a practical model for a church to follow. What he didn't expect was that after his death, these inconclusive private wrestlings would be published and turned into a manifesto of sorts, their authority sealed by his martyrdom. For Christians in the late 40s and 50s, who were ill at ease with the seamless segue to Cold War cheerleading, who were actually trying to reflect on the global catastrophe that most people were trying to put behind them, for them, Bonhoeffer was a light in the darkness and they were drawn to his ideas like moths. The discontent with churchiness, the moral clarity and urgency which he represented was embodied in 1950s churchmen like Trevor Huddleston, or above all, by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He was a careful reader of both Bonhoeffer 
and of the Mahatma Gandhi, with whom Bonhoeffer had once corresponded. One important result of this was that in that moment of cultural flux in the early 60s, some of the most compelling and authoritative Christian voices were advocating not for Christianity and for Christian ethics, as those things were normally understood. They were advocating for secularism. Anglican preachers of John Robinson's generation, many of them were making an earnest attempt to put Bonhoeffer's religionless Christianity into practice. The brilliant work done on this subject by Sam Barrett Taylor has shown how Britain's student Christian movement, which had been leading a modest uptick in Christian affiliation in the 1950s, in the 1960s redefines itself with an openness policy. Its, its new general secretary um, on, on the right there next to Dr. King, Ambrose Reeves, declared that we can best serve the churches by ceasing to be a religious society. The distaste in those quotes. The SCM began to define itself not in traditionally religious terms, but by the political causes it supported. And as a result, its membership collapsed. It fell by, by 90% during the period 1963 to 73. And that's not an accident, nor is it entirely unforeseen. It is an act of prophetic, you might almost say of Christ-like, institutional self-sacrifice. And in that sense, it's a microcosm of the experience of the Western Christian churches as a whole during these years. Because as they began to absorb the moral lessons of the Second World War, and Bonhoeffer's version of those lessons seemed particularly compelling, um, and, and, and I think that's simply because it resonates so well with how others are already beginning to think. As they absorb the war's moral lessons, it comes to seem self-evident to a great many Christians that the one thing they could no longer do with a good Christian conscience was simply to assert their Christianity, especially not in any way that was divisive or exclusive or made any kind of claim to superior status or knowledge. Even to claim that their story was the greatest story ever told, a claim that had once seemed innocent, almost a banal act of praise, that now felt like an act of arrogance. When secularist critics and scoffers set out to make fun of Christianity, and you know, this is the age of beyond the fringe, they did, a significant number of Christians rushed to join in the attack because they believed, with rather more fervor than the comedians, that Christianity as traditionally defined is part of the problem, not part of the solution. And of course, that conscientious reluctance by many Christians in the West, especially those in positions of leadership, to assert their own traditional doctrines for fear that such an assertion would be exclusive or offensive or discriminatory, a fear that is as much about conscience as it is about, about public appearances. That reluctance is, of course, very much still with us. To the extent, then, that Western societies have become secular, one of the reasons for that is that many Christians consciously and deliberately decided that it should be so. But as to what the secularism that was embraced was, we will come to that in the next lecture, which will start at half past 11.